So here is our chance to kick some ass for Mother Earth. I'm listening. Well, I've narrowed your choices down to five unthinkable options. Each will cause untold misery. I pick number three. You don't even want to read them first? I was elected to lead, not to read. Number three. Is outer space even real? It's a fake. As far as stars and wandering stars, also known as planets, are there, how could we deny them? We don't know what they actually are, but they are there. Now what we are told about outer space and what it is, is not true at all. Everything we believe about so-called outer space is due mostly to Hollywood movies and other media, including children's cartoons. Of course NASA propaganda is the biggest culprit. As we have already gone over, there are no pictures of Earth and even images of all the other so-called planets are computer generated. Except of course, for the pictures of Earth that are not photoshopped. Like the one we get every 12 or so hours from the Discover Satellite. NASA has gone on record numerous times stating that humans can't get past low Earth orbit. I'll explain after his clips where the author is wrong. But first, I would like to point out the irony of NASA trying to explain that space travel is impossible. That's not how any of this works. NASA's next spacecraft, already being built and tested across America, will do those things and more. This is the spacecraft that's going to take humans to explore uh, the solar system. It's the next big step for NASA in exploration. Called the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, or MPCV, this next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. The plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is supposedly between 99 and 1200 miles away. The funny thing is that they say the moon is over 200,000 miles away. How did we make it so far in the 1960s and 70s if we can't do it today? The Orion spacecraft will be hit with radiation like no other manned mission in history, due mostly to its length. The Apollo 17 moon missions spent about eight days in total for its trip to the moon. A manned mission to Mars would take about eight months of travel one way. This is why NASA is being super careful with its homework. But that doesn't answer how Apollo got through the Van Allen belts in the first place into the moon. Trajectory analysts found the safest way through the region, and mission planners reasoned that the astronauts would pass through the worst of the belts fast enough that they didn't need any additional protection. 
All the electronics and instrumentation lining the walls of the command module would give them enough of a kind of makeshift shelter. At the end of the Apollo program, NASA found that its astronauts had not been exposed to any more radiation than the average Atomic Energy Commission worker who deals with radioactivity on a daily basis is exposed to in a year. And really, in the scope of the Apollo program, a little bit of radiation exposure was not the highest risk the astronauts ran in going to the moon. The Orion spacecraft is not being built to withstand the Van Allen belt, but as much as a year and a half of continuous radiation exposure from outer space. That is what NASA is talking about. Also, it's funny to me how the Van Allen belts appear to be a real threat to space travel, even though space travel in space are actually fake. I'm retarded? Also, the International Space Station, just like everything else brought to us by NASA, is a fake Freemasonic hoax, completely fabricated and done with special effects, models, pools, zero-g planes, and various other camera tricks. How is circumnavigation possible on a flat earth? Very easily. You can travel east and west directions to ultimately end up right back where you started. The face of the earth looks similar to that of a clock. In fact, clocks were most likely designed after the true appearance of our world. That doesn't make sense. If you follow a compass east for long enough, you'll make a full circuit. Same thing if you travel west long enough. Water, fire, air, and dirt. Fucking magnets. How do they work? And I don't want to talk to a scientist. As we've already gone over, the flat earth map that was around before globes were easily converts to a globe. So everything you believe you are doing on a globe is actually taking place on a flat earth. I cannot fathom how you can create a magnetic field that would fit the way he is saying. This model does not allow for reverse inclination in the southern hemisphere. Inclination is a huge issue for this model. How come the moon is upside down in the southern hemisphere? This is another very simple explanation. When somebody is in the northern part of the Earth, or on the northern part of the Earth, they see the moon from this angle. When somebody is on the southern part of the Earth, the moon looks like this. They're looking at it from this angle. They see it from the opposite angle, and that's all it is. Imagine you tape a picture of the moon in the center of your living room, right? Depending on where you are in the room, the moon will be seen differently. When pondering this question, keep in mind that the face of the moon never changes. On a spherical Earth, we'd expect to see other sides, but we never have. If the Earth was truly flat, his explanation of seeing an upside-down moon would be true. However, when you take into account seasons, the moon would need to shift, thereby ruining his pretty little picture. As to why we don't see the far side of the moon, that's easy. We always see the same old side of the moon because the moon rotates exactly once on its axis each time it orbits Earth. What about the seasons? The sun is close and small, and it circles around and above the flat Earth in a spiral pattern on the Tropic of Cancer in the northern summer months and then down in the Tropic of Capricorn in the northern winter months. So when the sun is further away from the North Pole, right, the center of the flat Earth, it's winter in the north and summer in the south. Since the sun is smaller than we are told and closer, it makes much more sense that we experience seasons in the first place. If the sun was 93 million miles away and had a radius of over 400,000 miles, we would hardly experience temperature fluctuation as we do. Huh? But I... What? What about gravity?
It's a fake. Gravity is necessary in order for a spinning ball Earth to work. People readily believe that you can't fall off of a spinning ball that's darting through outer space at speeds that you can't even comprehend, yet they will deny how much easier it is to stay on a flat surface that doesn't move. I don't think one of the issues with a flat Earth is people flying off of it. Gravity is a scapegoat for all that cannot be explained, and it has never been proven. The reason why things fall or float is because of density and buoyancy. If something is heavier than air, it falls. If it's lighter than air, it floats. Very straightforward. Your phone is denser than the air, therefore it falls when you drop it. Everything works because of density. No need to factor in imaginary components. That was so terrible, I think you gave me cancer! Easy debunk here. Drop two objects with different densities in a vacuum. A ball has a higher density than a feather, yet falls at the same speed. Am I to believe the density has somehow changed in the ball? Do I detect a note of sarcasm? Are you kidding me? This baby is off the charts! <laughs> Quote, The law of gravitation is said by the advocates of the Newtonian system of astronomy to be the greatest discovery of science and the foundation of the whole of modern astronomy. If, therefore, it can be shown that gravitation is a pure assumption and an imagination of the mind only, that it has no existence outside of the brains of its expounders and advocates, the whole of the hypotheses of this modern so-called science fall to the ground as flat as the surface of the ocean. And this most exact of all sciences, this wonderful feat of the intellect, becomes at once the most ridiculous superstition and the most gigantic imposture to which ignorance and credulity could ever be exposed. Thomas Winship, Zetetic Cosmogony. Good job. Good job. Really good job. What about the Coriolis effect? It's a fake! They say that the Coriolis effect is a result of the Earth spinning and is responsible for the deflection of an object moving above the Earth rightward in the northern hemisphere and leftward in the southern hemisphere. The problem is that things like hurricanes and water in the sink aren't always predictable and have been known to spin both ways in either hemisphere. The Coriolis effect is a planet-sized phenomenon. As such, it plays a lesser role on smaller things. Unlike the old wives' tale, the Coriolis effect does not cause your flush to spin in a certain direction. That is caused by the path the water takes. Does this disprove the Coriolis effect? Hardly. When you expand out larger, the, Cor the Coriolis effect becomes more prominent. I could not find one example of a hurricane that has spun backwards like the author is trying to get you to believe. Also, another contradiction that proves the Coriolis effect false is the fact that no flying machine above the Earth has to account for it. If a bullet that travels 1,700 miles per hour has to account for the effect, then an airplane traveling at 550 miles per hour would definitely have to account for the effect. When you look for the answer, you'll find that we are told that since the atmosphere moves with the spin of the Earth, planes aren't affected. So why would bullets be? Especially when they go much faster than common airplanes. Perhaps you should explain to the snipers and long-range gun enthusiasts how the Coriolis effect is simply all a Jewish conspiracy. It's not like these people have to deal with it every time they shoot their guns. Why can't I see infinitely far? 
This is for the people that wonder why they can't see certain things that they believe they should be able to see if the earth was flat. I've been asked on numerous occasions, why can't I see Mount Everest from anywhere on earth? I've also been asked, why can't I see Spain from the east coast of America? Well, besides dirt, dust, dew, rain, fog, smog, smoke, clouds, mist, haze, snow, etc., your vision is limited by the vanishing point of your perception. Check your weather app on your phone and notice the visibility in your area. If you want to see something that is very far away, what would you use? If you guess a telescope, you are officially smarter than a flat earther. Congratulations. I wonder why the author didn't mention them. I'm acting astonished. Is the flat earth a religious thing? Yes and no. I say this because I myself am not religious. I'd rather not have faith in something, but know the facts to the best of my ability. And the facts are that the curvature and motion of the earth have never been proven. The Bible without any doubt whatsoever supports the earth that's fixed in place. The book of Enoch, which is biblically endorsed and most likely belongs in the Bible, describes the flat stationary enclosed earth in great detail. Many religions and civilizations preceding Judaism and Christianity support a flat and stationary earth, such as the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Norse, the Hindus, etc. This fantastic spinning globe earth is very new to the people of the world, yet most of us carry on as if the theory is unquestionable, and we've been conditioned to laugh when the flat earth is brought up. <laughs> oh wait, you're serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> Whether you are religious or not, you can see the flat earth for yourself. Is the Flat Earth Society behind the resurgence of the Flat Earth? This is gonna be good. No, the Flat Earth Society is designed as a containment unit. Gatekeepers that tell the truth about some stuff, but then lie about other things in order to make it appear ridiculous or steer you in the wrong direction. For instance, this is what FES has to say about gravity. In the flat earth model, gravity, rather than being a force, is the upward acceleration of the flat earth. The earth always accelerates upward at 1g, which is equivalent to the gravitational acceleration in the round earth model. Like the force of gravity, the earth's acceleration causes several commonly observed phenomena in our daily lives. If that isn't the biggest turnoff, I don't know what is. I love how the guy that thinks gravity is some huge Illuminati Masonic Jewish conspiracy is trash talking the Flat Earth Society for believing gravity exists. It's like he's the rock or something. Ah, hey, don't do it, don't do it. The Flat Earth argument has never died. It only died down. Real Flat Earthers have always been among us, but it wasn't until late 2014, early 2015, when Eric Dubé started making a lot of noise about the Flat Earth conspiracy and got people like myself on board. It took me 10 months of research before finally accepting the truth about where we live. Thanks to the many great Flat Earth researchers, content creators, and activists since then, more and more people are waking up to the massive deception every day. Are all scientists, pilots, and members of the government in on it? No, most scientists, pilots, and members of the government have been indoctrinated just as the rest of us have. When they work at their everyday job, they go about it as if the Earth is most certainly spherical. If indeed some of these people did know the earth is flat, they most likely wouldn't even speak out about it in fear of losing their job or ruining their reputation. 
The average scientist goes about everything they do with the spherical Earth already factored in. For mainstream science, questioning our current model is a huge no-no. A far too common misconception of science is that dissent is punished. Believe me when I say every biologist in the world would love to disprove evolution, and every physicist would love to disprove gravity. Science only progresses when the right questions are asked. The problem with the flat earth argument is that there is no meat or substance to it. For pilots, computers do most of their work, not to take away from what they do because I personally appreciate it, and also pilots often switch out at stops, making it difficult to understand the real layout of Earth's land masses. And any pilot that would fly high enough to see the Earth's curvature is a liar and a shill. As far as government members and politicians go, besides high-ranking officials at NASA, which isn't government at all, it's safe to assume that they are not in the know and they are not knowingly perpetrating this lie. Very few people compared to the population of the world are enlightened to the Flat Earth.